afternoon. Welcome to Berean. Good to see everyone here tonight. Um, looking forward to another great service message from the Lord. Um, welcome to our guests and our visitors as well. Okay, let's stand please. Let's start our worship this evening with a word of prayer. And then after that, we'll have some singing. I'd like to ask Brother Darwin to come and uh, lead us in a word of prayer this time. Let's pray. Dear God and our Heavenly Father, we just thank you, Lord, for all the blessings that we had for this week and also, Lord, for the opportunity to worship you again this evening service. I just pray, dear God, for your message, Lord. Help us to understand it. Help us to have the wisdom that is coming from your word. Please bless our pastor as he delivers your message, Lord, for tonight. This I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's remain standing. Let's have some songs tonight before the message. First song. Sing this hymn. This world is not my home. I'm just a passing through. Verse 1. This world is not my home. I'm just a passing through. My treasures are laid out. song such love such wondrous love another hymn such love verse one that god should love a sinner such as i should yearn to change my sorrow into bliss no rest till he had led to bring me nigh how wonderful is love like this such love
spread the sky. But when traveling days are over, not a shadow, not a sign. If you have your Bibles, uh, Philippians chapter number 4. Just going to read one verse to you, a very familiar verse, verse 19. But my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Let's bow in prayer. Dear Holy Father, we do come to you this afternoon. We thank you, Lord, for our health. We thank you, dear God, for the truth of this verse. And Lord, for allowing us to be here because you have uh, supplied all of our needs. And I do pray, Lord, we'll understand and realize how gracious and loving you are. I do pray, dear Lord, for the uh, situation with the internet at this time. I pray that we come back online. I do pray, Lord, that uh, the live streaming will continue to... Uh, be able to be used, dear Lord, to uh, those that cannot come or did not come this evening. Just thank you again for those that are here. Bless our time together. We just pray that you'll uh, help us to be uh, attentive, Lord, to this very important truth, dear Lord, of how uh, you do supply our needs. We'll be careful to thank you for it, for asking in Jesus' name and for his sake and all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Thank you. you. may be seated. Of course, during this pandemic, uh, many uh, problems have arisen uh, besides wearing the mask and shield and all the other inconveniences and the restrictions. Uh, times are tight because of the pandemic. Uh, the economy is suffering and you know a lot of people are suffering as well. But what I do know is that God will never be a debtor to anyone. That, that's impossible to happen. Someone may be uh, here this evening and they would say, Pastor, how can you be so sure that God will, be, that God will never be a debtor to anyone? Uh, do you know every situation around the world? And I would have to say, of course, I do not know every situation around the world, but I don't have to know every situation around the world because I know personally the true and living God of the Word of God that cannot lie and that makes promises to us that we can certainly trust in uh, throughout eternity. Uh, my faith is based on the Word of God and the God of this Word, and I hope your faith is the same. Our faith is in the Lord. Our faith is in His Word. Uh, he's never given us any reason to doubt Him or to doubt His Word. Job's testimony, uh, Job said, Naked came I out of my mother's womb, and naked shall I re return thither. The Lord gave, and the Lord had taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And we know how terrible it was in the life of Job, all that he had lost, uh, all of the possessions, uh, his family, his children, uh, how sad that was. And yet he had the right attitude, and he had the right understanding of who God was and the right that God had to take away. God gave me all that I have, and God has the right to take it away. Paul mentions the same thing, writing to Timothy. He says, for we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain that we can carry nothing out. If more people would understand that and realize that, instead of trying to uh, you know, gain so much wealth in this world that they're not taking with them, they're going to leave it behind for someone else to inherit it. And yet they spend their entire lifetime seeing how much, uh, how much they can accumulate. The Bible says every good and perfect gift is from above, cometh down from the Father of lights, with whom is no variableness, neither shadow 
of turning. And I believe this verse continues to verify who God is. God does not, God is not flippant. God does not change. God is immutable. That means he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He is no respecter of persons. There's no shadow of turning. There's no difference in God. Eternity past until eternity future. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He doesn't change. And that's why he is so trustworthy. Because he doesn't change. He doesn't love you today and hate you tomorrow. That's not the God of the Bible. And so he has every right to take back whatever he has given to us because it has come from him. No matter how many millions or billions someone accumulates, it's all left behind for someone else to inherit. And sad to say, normally when that happens, the per person or the people that inherit it, normally they can't handle it. And they squander it many, many times. The typical heart of man is unthankful. Can I get an amen? The typical heart of man is unthankful. Israel, God's chosen people, we need to understand that they were not the church, okay? The Lord Jesus Christ came to establish his church when he was here upon the earth. But we certainly can see many similarities of the deceitfulness and unthankful spirit of man's heart in both cases. Whether we look back in the Old Testament concerning the children of Israel, whether we come into the New Testament, the day of grace under the church that the Lord Jesus Christ established, I mean, it's the same. The heart of man is deceitful and desperately wicked. Who can know it but only God? Psalm 78, 19, it says, Yea, they, talking about the children of Israel, they spake against God. This is God's chosen people. And they said, Can God furnish a table in the wilderness? How sad is that? Speaking against God, challenging God, defaming God. What is the answer to that question? Can God supply a table in the wilderness, yes or no? You can say something, you can say yes. Ladies, you can say yes as well. If the men won't say something, you can say it. Certainly God can supply a table in the wilderness and certainly God did supply a table in the wilderness. He gave them the fowls from the air. He gave them the water from the rock. He supplied their needs in the wilderness. Can he do that? Shame on Israel for asking that dumb question. Here in Philippians 4, we're in a section where the, the Apostle Paul is thanking the church for their support, partnering with him. Verse 10, he says, But I rejoice in the Lord greatly that now at the last your care of me hath flourished again, wherein you were also careful, but ye lacked opportunity. The Apostle Paul, we know, was arrested. He was put in prison, and obviously at that time they had lost uh, a contact with him, but now the support has once begun and has been revived. But listen to the next verse, verse number 11. Not that I speak in respect of want, for I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. We talked a little bit about this this morning, and I, I have found that the Lord has been doing this constantly when I have a message for the morning, and then the Lord gives me a message for the afternoon. Many times it kind of goes together, and uh, certainly that, that's been happening. Maybe you haven't noticed it, but I certainly have uh, recently for sure. He says, I don't speak in respect of one. I've learned whatever state I am. So when you're supporting me, praise the Lord. I thank God for it. But when you lost contact and I did not get the support, still my God was supplying my needs. I have learned. I wish, you know, we would learn that as well. What a great testimony from the Apostle Paul. There's no complaint. He's not saying, well, when you were su su supplying my need, Praise the Lord, all my needs were met, but once you stopped, then, you know, it was very difficult for me. We don't find him uh, having a Kohawa attitude at all, uh, in spite of the trials, in spite of the perils, in spite of the difficulties and hardships that he had. Uh, 
What does he say? He says, I've learned. I've learned when God takes care of my needs. He always does that, sometimes not as much as others, but when things are tough, things are tight, he says, I've learned. I'm still content. I haven't starved to death is what he's saying. God's taken care of my needs. I really believe the, the love and the uh, faithfulness that the Apostle Paul had uh, caused him to love the Lord with all his heart. What, what, I, what I mean is, is because before the Apostle Paul was saved, he had one, one motive, one reason for living, and that was to go and to destroy the church that Jesus established and to destroy and to kill all the followers of that church. That was his one purpose. That was his one goal. That's all he did. And... I really think that Paul lived with that constantly. I mean, after he got saved, you know, Paul could look back and Paul could say, I'm the chiefest of sinners. I've sinned more than any other human has ever sinned because of what I did and the destruction that I tried to bring and that I did bring to the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. And yet God, in spite of what I did, in spite of my hatred, he never stopped loving me. Understand that. And a lot of people, they, they look at God and they, I've had people say, God could never forgive me. Well, Paul said, look, God forgave me. Here I was, like the Antichrist, going around trying to destroy the church, and yet God never stopped loving me, not for one second. And here Paul gets saved. Paul comes to the knowledge of the truth. And you talk about someone that has sold out 110%. It was the Apostle Paul. No matter what the Lord brought him through, he was thinking, hey, I was on the other side of this persecution before. Now I'm getting some of my, you know, I, I'm reaping what I sowed. Before I was the one going around and getting the Christians. Now they're after me and they're wanting to kill me. We sang such love, such wondrous love. And that's what God has for you and for me. Such love, such wondrous love. All of us are guilty of sinning after we're saved. Amen. And thank God he doesn't stop loving us. He continues to love us wholly, fully. What we find here, Paul stated that it was a learning process for him in his life to understand not only the love of God, but the provision of God and the way God provided for him. Paul says, I know how to be abased. I know how to be abound. Everywhere in all things I am instructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. Again, Paul is not mincing words and Paul is not, you know, he, he is just writing from the heart as the Holy Spirit leads him. But this is from his heart. This is from his life. Paul said, I know how to be a base. Certainly, I'm, I was the one uh, seeking and, and going after Christians before, now they're coming after me. I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things, I am instructed both to be full and to be hungry, to abound and to suffer need. Paul said, you know, he's still God. Whether I have more than enough or whether I'm suffering need, he's still God. He's still there. He's still caring for me. He hasn't forsaken me. Paul, under the Lord's care and instruction, was a good student in learning what he was taught. Sometimes we're not good students. Sometimes we are hard of hearing, slow learners. The Lord's trying to teach us something. Times to be full, times to be hungry. Times to abound, times to not have enough. Times of suffering, times of need. But the Lord is still there. Understand that. God, because of... Uh, Maybe our prayers or our needs aren't being answered. Certainly they are from God's perspective. Sometimes we have to suffer a little bit to appreciate when he does give us something, how to appreciate it. He says, for unto you is given in behalf of Christ, not only to believe on him, but also to what? To suffer for his sake. Not a popular verse for the prosperity preacher. They're not going to preach that. They're going to preach prosperity. 
And yet it's not always prosperity as far as financial situations are concerned. Paul is speaking from experience. And then he says in verse 13, I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. This is who he learned from. Who did he learn? Who was his teacher? The Lord Jesus Christ. I believe the Lord Jesus Christ was his tutor, was his teacher. Enabled him to endure the suffering. I can do all things. I can suffer. Jesus suffered for me. The least I can do is suffer for him. That was his attitude. Then in verse 17, he manifests his true desire for the church. He says, not because I desire a gift. Paul, again, is a being very transparent, but I desire fruit that may abound to your account. Paul is letting them know, I thank the Lord for your offering. I thank the Lord for your, uh, your support. I thank the Lord that it has, it has abounded again. God is using you to meet my needs. But he said, I want you to understand, I am not seeking that. If the Lord lays it on your heart and the Lord is causing you to to support me, to help me uh, meet my needs. Paul was a tent maker. He didn't want to ever be a burden to any of the churches. He worked with his hands. Make the tent, sell the tents, and use that. Praise the Lord, he says, I didn't desire a gift, but I do desire fruit that may abound to your account. Every year during our missions month and every year during our missions conference, certainly we're talking or we're going to come here to Philippians because this is, this is really about missions, about giving. The truth of our faith promise, it is a double blessing. First of all, we have the joy of giving now and hearing, hearing from the missionaries that we support, new churches being started, new ministries being started, Souls being saved, lives being changed. I don't know about you, but that's a blessing to hear that because we have a part in that. If you're giving the faith promise, certainly you have a part in that. That is fruit abounding to your account. At the same time, every soul that is saved is spiritual fruit. Now, we can't go online. Uh, it's probably good that we can't go online and, uh, you know, uh, dial up and to go to our bank account in heaven and say, okay, I want to see how much I have. You know, we can do that down here, and a lot of people do. I think I told you about, uh, about my aunt in California one time when I was out there by myself reporting to churches and happened to be able to stop by and visit her. She, of course, she was older, kids, empty nest. Her husband had passed away. And I remember her showing me uh, on the computer, all of her stocks and how they were doing, probably she checked that every single day to see how the stocks were doing, her investments. And uh, I was thinking, I'm completely ignorant of what you're showing me because I don't have any stocks and I don't have any investments. Our, our investment is not here in this world. Why, why should we invest in this world when we're not going to be here very long? I mean, to me, yeah, I would not, you know, I would not uh, talk poorly about someone that did, but the thing is, is for mom and I, praise the Lord. We have our investment in heaven, amen? I mean, that's where, that's where we're going to spend eternity. The Bible says our life is but a vapor. It appeared for a little time and vanisheth away, and yet most of the world, the majority of the world, spends their whole life trying to accumulate and have this kingdom down here, this mansion down here, that's only going to last for a very short, short time. They're going to be able to enjoy it. And what so often is the case is they find out that this is too big. We don't need something this big. We have to hire all these people to clean it and to maintain it. And they end up selling it and getting something smaller. Second Corinthians 9.10. Now he that ministered see to the sower... Both minister bread for your food and multiply your seed sown and increase the fruits of your righteousness. Again, the whole message is about God providing for us, God taking care of us. And we see in this verse that's probably on the overhead. Now he that ministered seed to the sower, everyone that's here should know from our 
many missions conferences each year and being a missions-minded, missions-hearted church, the first he is talking about God. God is the one that ministers or that gives us the seed to sow. And it's not talking about the Bible here. It's not talking about the gospel here. This is talking about money, okay? God is the one that gives us the money or we are to be the sowers, the seed to the sower, first and foremost to what? Both to minister bread for your food. So God blesses us to take care of our needs. I mean, if God doesn't take care of our needs, we die, then, <laughs> then we can't give the missions. God is going to take care of you and I. We cannot outgive the Lord. God gives us money to use for his ministry and then also to use, he says here, to minister bread for our food. Multiplies our seed that is sown, the money that we give, he increases the fruit of our righteousness. So God takes care of us. He meets our needs. Then he gives us enough to give to missions. And, and this enters into the faith issue. How strong is our faith? How strong is our faith in the Lord to obey what he leads us to do, what he leads us to give by faith? And as the years go on and on and on and on, what, what takes place? Now it continues to grow. It continues to increase. We're never to go backwards. We're never to, never to retreat. We're always to go forward for the Lord. So you add 10 years. You add 20 years. You add 25 years or 30 years. And if you're adding for 25 or 30 years, now you're at a place where you're thinking, Lord, this is impossible to continue on to give more. And yet the Lord says, no, by faith. Trust in me. I will meet the need that I am telling you to give. But the flesh is always there to argue, and the flesh is always there to doubt. But then the Spirit is always there, and God is always there to continue to increase our faith. And so by faith, what do we do? We follow. He says here, He multiplies our seed sown, he increases, he increases all that we give. He multiplies. Not addition, but multiplication. What is given here in and through Berean, understand and realize that we support 80 plus missionaries. If we supported one missionary, then whatever that missionary did, that would be fruit abounding to our account. But we support over 80 missionaries, and you figure all these missionaries working, the ministries they start, the baby churches and other churches, whether they, they start a church and then leave it and go start another church, however they're doing it, it doesn't make any difference. All the fruit that's abounding to our account is being multiplied through all these missionaries. Paul then says, but I have all and abound. I am full, having received of Epaphroditus the things which were sent from you in odor of sweet smelling, a sacrifice acceptable, well-pleasing. He is saying because of their generosity. Now don't forget the church of Philippi was one of the Macedonian churches that we read over in 2 Corinthians 8 that were so poor. They were impoverished. So here you have this poor church and yet they are the ones that are supporting Paul. No other one is supporting him. Nobody else is supporting him, but they are supporting him. What a heart they had for missions. Send, sending Epaphroditus, who also was sick. He says, an odor, a sweet smell, a sacrifice acceptable, well-pleasing to God. I'm, cer I'm certain it wasn't the smell of the dried fish, amen, that you have here in the Philippines. That is not a, that is not a sweet odor. I am sure he's not talking about that. But their generosity, it was pleasing to God. I imagine that the gift that they gave, the support that, he get, that they gave to, to the Apostle Paul was very large for the church that was so poor, impoverished. They were in poverty. And yet I can't help but believe that Paul is, is, is bragging on them and he's, he's thanking them and he's saying, now I, I'm, I'm abounding once again. 
I am abounding because of your gift, because of your love. I have seen in, uh, I've seen in the States where I can go to a small church that may, may have 40 members, and yet they give a bigger love, love offering than some churches that run a couple hundred or several hundred. What is the Lord saying? The Lord is saying, quit looking and walking by sight. Walk by faith. Trust me. I'll, I'm going to take care of your needs. Continue to look to me. Continue to trust in me. Again, that's the way the Lord is teaching. It's not the size of the church. It's the size of the hearts of the members of the church. That's what makes a difference. And thank God for those individuals and for those Christians. They may have a small ministry as far as numbers is concerned, but they have a big heart concerning missions and giving, and the Lord is concerned. For them, their gift certainly was a true sacrifice, one that was well-pleasing to God. But again, he's looking beyond the outward of the givers, and he looks into the heart of the givers. And that's what God is doing. God is pleased and God is blessed when we give that way by faith. Now we come to verse 9. And this verse is often taken out of context. And it is made a blanket statement for all believers. And again, this would definitely go with the prosperity preachers and the prosperity gospel. Where they would use this verse for their teaching. And many times when it is quoted, the first word, which is but, which is a conjunction, which ties it or connects it back with the reason of the promise. Church of Philippi and churches like the church at Philippi that give sacrificially to missions is to whom this promise is made. Not to all churches, not to all Christians. It's not written to the world. It's not written even to all believers. Certainly isn't written to anyone that's selfish. It's written to those that are liberal and that give sacrificially, that love the Lord and love lost souls and that are willing to be faithful to give that the lost souls might be saved. I find no place in Scripture where God promises to meet the needs of a believer who is not following God's leading in their life concerning finances or giving or stewardship. I don't find any verse in the Word of God that states that. God does say, though, in Malachi, He does give a promise, but the promise is to those that are not tithing, He's saying, I will curse them with the curse. Now, I'm not trying to make God look like some bad, some bad, a bad God or, a, a, you know, a mean God. No, I, I'm just trying to say that we need to look at the Word of God and the God of this Word the way that the Bible portrays Him. He's a loving God, but He's also a God that desires to bless those that will obey His Word, those that will follow His Word. The blessings come through obedience. So this promise that we read in this verse is not to the world, for sure. It's not to all churches, for sure. Uh, there are churches called Missionary Baptist Churches. And from what my understanding of them is they're really not missions-minded at all. <laughs> they should not have that name, Missionary Baptist Church, because they're not supporting missionaries. So I don't know why they call that. Maybe they were started by a missionary. I don't know. In Abraham's greatest trial of his life, he said to his son Isaac, God will what? God will provide. Now you talk about faith. Isaac spake unto Abraham his father and said, Behold the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? We're carrying the fire, we're carrying the wood, but where is the lamb? Where is the, where is the offering? I'm confused here. And Abraham said, my son, God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. So they went both of them together. Now there's a lot of faith there. Because up to this point, there is no lamb. Up to this point, Abraham is supposed to take Isaac up and offer him up. He's the lamb. And yet Abraham hasn't told him he's the lamb. 
Abraham believed, according to the Bible, that if he did go through and kill Isaac, that God would raise him up again. He was going to be that obedient. His faith was that strong. That I'm going to obey God, even though this is the last thing that I ever want to do. If God's telling me to do it, he has a purpose for it. That is great faith. To take this, his son, his only son, as far as God was concerned, to take his life after waiting how many years? But I'll do it, Lord, if this is your will for my life. And Abraham called the name of that place Jehovah Jireh, God will supply, God our provider. What faith, what love, what commitment. Three things that we are going to look at concerning verse 19 in closing. The first one is the source of the supply. Where does the source of our supply come from? My God. Who are you looking to for your needs to be met? Or where are you looking for your needs to be met? Many times, by God's grace, Mom and I have been able to have a part in the missionary training seminar. And we thank the Lord for that, training new missionaries. New missionaries that are surrendering, beginning, preparing to go out on deputation. I always stress to these missionaries, I tell them right at the outset, I say, stop looking to pastors. You're looking to pastors. Stop looking to pastors. Look to the Lord. Pastors aren't supplying your needs. God is supplying your needs. Look to the source beyond the pastors, beyond the churches. Don't try to add up. Look to the Lord. Walk by faith. Live by faith. Trust God and seek from him, what he wants to give to you. Why go through all of the different channels when go to the source? God wants you to go to him. God wants us to go to him. I tell him if God has called you to go somewhere, well then God will get you there. Have that confidence. If you know God's called you to go someplace, God will get you someplace, to the place that he's called you to go. If you don't believe that, well, then you're in the wrong place and you have the wrong attitude. You need to go out and get a job someplace, not inside the ministry. If you don't believe God, why would you serve him? Come on, if we're going to believe God, we need to believe him 100%. At the same time, if God hasn't called you, then he has no obligation to get you anywhere. Hello? And there are sad, sad to say, there are missionaries that God's never called. There are missionaries that their mama called them. Their mama says, you need to be a missionary. Or their, their dad, who maybe is a pastor, called him and says, you need to go here, you need to go there. I know it happens. I know it happens here in the Philippines, all around the world, where pastors, they become they take the place of the Lord and they tell this young man, this is where you need to go. Now, I'm not saying that God can't use that, but at the same time, why don't you let the man go to God and let God show him? Then he has the assurance God is calling him there, you're not calling him there, you're not sending him there. Because if there's that doubt and he doesn't have the assurance that God's called him there, how is he going to stay there when times get hard? They're going to get mad at the pastor. The husband's going to look at his wife and he says, Pastor, pastor made us come here and this is, what, this is not where we're supposed to be. That's a terrible situation. But if they know God's called them there, then they, <laughs> who are they going to get mad at? God, God, you've called us here. And many missionaries have gone through that as well. God, you've called us here and we don't seem blessed and we, we don't see souls being saved and the ministry's not going good. Just suck it up and trust the Lord and continue on. God did not promise us a, a bed of roses. So if you call us from your mama, your dad, uh, your pastor, maybe a missionary. How many missionaries come to churches and they say, we need more laborers in our field? Well, God can use that, certainly. But God can get, you know, get, uh, uh, get close to, a, to another missionary, a young missionary. They're already good friends and he can say, hey, come to the mission field. We can work together. 
And we've seen that as well, where missionaries can be so close, and then a couple years later, they can be enemies and want to stay far away from each other. What I'm saying is no one should be calling except the Lord because he's the one calling. He's the one that needs to call. Trials will come. How many missionaries have, have, has mom and I seen come to the Philippines? And guess what? Many of them didn't stay. They didn't stick. I personally believe they probably didn't have a call to be able to leave that way. If they had a call, I believe they'd still be here. And I'm not saying missionaries that stayed here 40 years or a long time. I'm saying missionaries that came for maybe one term or less than a term and they left. Probably didn't have a call. At least it wasn't from the Lord. If they did, they would, they'd still be here. I believe with all my heart. The source of our supply is my God. My God shall supply all your needs. The scope of the supply all your needs. It does not say all your greeds. Big difference. And yes, even in the ministry, there can be some that are looking for their greeds to be met more than their needs to be met. Sad to say, even in the ministry. We need to be like the Apostle Paul and learn to be content with what the Lord gives to us. Understanding God's economy helps tremendously. Wisdom from above. God's word tells us. Tells us how to live. Tells us how to give. Tells us how to receive. Everything that we need is found in the word of God. This is our instruction manual for life. Irregardless if we're in the ministry full time or not. For all of us. We have the same book, the same manual. Remember, God's ways are not the world's ways for sure, not our ways for sure as well. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things that you're seeking, really in context, will be added unto you. Food and clothing, main needs. God will take care of that. His promise, he cannot lie. Our mansion is over the hilltop. Our mansion is not here and now. Don't be looking for it here and now. Don't be expecting it here and now. Why would you? It's so, we're here so for such a short amount of time compared to eternity. Jesus did not come to get. We, we are to follow his example. He did not come to get anything. He came to give everything. Give his life. He did not gain anything of value when he came to this world. You and I did not add value to God. That may be humbling, but it's true. He did not come. He did not gain any value, but he gave something that was priceless, his life. Priceless. Beyond this whole world and all its riches and all the billionaires that you have. Nothing compared to what the Lord Jesus Christ gave. He gave his all to redeem us from sin. Jesus says over in Luke 12, he said, Take heed and beware of covetousness, for a man's life consisteth not in the abundance of the things which he possesseth. You know, when you, when you realize the, the teaching of Scripture and you realize the truth of that verse, the truth of the matter is, is that no, none of us possess anything it's all on loan the bible says we are stewards god is the owner the owner not only of not only of things but god is the owner of you and me and it's so easy to get removed from that truth and thinking oh you know i've earned i've gone out and i've worked hard and i i've saved and i've invested and now i have this and i have that no none of that belongs to you or me none of it god owns it all plus you plus me so we already have established god is the giver of all things and certainly he owns us as well if we're his children 
So it makes sense that there is wisdom in submitting to him and submitting to his will. There's a lot of wisdom there. I mean, if he's all-powerful, and he is, if he owns everything and he does, it's real wise to get in good with God and to say, okay, Lord, I belong to you. Tell me what to do, and I'm going to do it. There's wisdom in that. Saved in 1974, served for two years in the church, surrendered for full-time service two years later. Within two weeks, we sold our house, moved out to California, PC, BBC, Pacific Coast Baptist Bible College. That's 45 years ago. Wow, 45 years. For the young people who are thinking, somebody that's 45 years old, that's old. That's just since we got saved, since I got saved. 45 years ago, serving the Lord. And guess what? God has not ever, ever failed to meet our need. Never. The standard of supply. The standard is according to his riches and glory. Not out of his riches, but according to his riches. The illustration... This illustration is, so one day you're out here on Sukkot, and a man is going to step out down on the street, and here comes this car flying around the corner, and sometimes cars do that without looking, they just fly out, and this man is going to get run over and killed by this car, but you just happen to be there, and you reach out and grab him and pull him back and actually save his life. And unbeknownst to you, lo and behold, who is it? None other than Bill Gates, the billionaire. You just saved his life. And he's so grateful and he's so thankful. So he reaches in and he pulls out a thousand peso bill and he gives it to you. He says, thank you so much. Now you're thinking, this is Bill Gates, the billionaire. I just saved his life and he gave me a thousand pesos. Praise the Lord for the thousand pesos. But, you know, I thought maybe he would have done something bigger and better. He's a billionaire. Scenario number two is he so thankful and so grateful, he says, uh, you just saved my life. He said, I want you to come across the street with me. And of course, he's going to look now, make sure there's nobody else trying to kill him. Walks across the street with you, he goes over to his Rolls Royce that's parked over there, and he, he opens it up and reaches in the glove compartment, he pulls out a checkbook, takes it out on the hood of the car, he writes his, writes his name, he leaves it blank, rips it out of the checkbook, and he gives it to you. And he says, I want you to go home and I want you to tally up all your bills, all your debts, past debts, present debts, plans for the future, whatever it may be, any need that you have, any need that you can think of. And he says, I want you to fill that in. That thousand pesos he was given to you was out of his riches. That check that he gave to you that was blank was according to his riches. Big difference. My Bible says God will bless us and meet our needs according to his riches. We have a liberal God. How much more liberal can he get than giving his own son to die for you and for me? There's no price tag on that. Manifest his love. God knows our needs, but God also knows what we can handle. You know, there's a lot of people, they win the lottery or whatever it may be, and they become a millionaire overnight. And for many, many people, it's a nightmare for them. It's not a blessing, it's a curse. Because now every relative is going to come and say, Oh, well, now you're rich, now you can meet my need. Overwhelming. Overwhelming. We sang, this world is not my home. Again, it's not bragging, it's just a matter of fact. We don't have, we don't have any investments. We don't have a home in this world that we own. Where we're staying now, the church takes care of us. Actually, it's the Lord taking care of us through the church, amen? That's what I believe. I'm not trying to be little or being unthankful for the church. I, I love you guys. I know you guys love us. But it's the Lord, ultimately, bottom line. Every good and perfect gift comes from Him. Get to the States. We live with one of our daughters. 
Why invest here? Why invest here? It's going to be gone. Whatever investment you make that you can't take with you, it's going to be left behind. It is so much, there is so much wisdom in investing for eternity. I've said it how many times in the past, I'll continue to say it as long as I have breath. I believe all of us will regret that we didn't do more, that we didn't give more when our faith becomes sight. Now, we'll be thankful for what we've done, but we'll all regret, why didn't we do more? Why didn't I do more? Why didn't I give more? Why didn't I, why didn't I, why didn't I? There will never, ever be one person that would say, man, I gave too much. I could have, I could have spent more down there. No, <laughs> that will never be the case. It would be, why didn't I give more? Why wasn't I more liberal? Why didn't I have more faith? Why didn't I trust the Lord more? Our investment is somewhere beyond the blue as we sing. Our investment is being multiplied as I speak. Praise the Lord. It's exciting, anticipating the things that God has prepared for them that love him. Where's your investment this evening? Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we do thank you for your word. We thank you, dear God, for the truth of your word, for the power of your word. And dear Lord, for the convicting power as well. And I do pray tonight, dear Lord, that you'll take the message, use it for your honor and glory. Pray that you would open up understanding, Lord, in our hearts and lives of who you are and who we are and how indebted we are to you. Dear Lord, everything we have, everything that you place in our possession, even as stewards, we are blessed by it but we are also accountable for it. So I do pray, dear Lord, that we would be faithful, faithful to you, faithful to your leadership uh, in our lives, faithful in our tithes, faithful in our offerings, faithful in our time, faithful in every area of just following you, believing you, and serving you, and loving you as you loved us. Use the message as only you can I pray, dear Lord, that you'll receive honor and glory through it. We'll be careful to thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand as we have an opportunity to respond to the word of God this evening? I don't know your need. I don't know your heart. But certainly if the Lord spoke to you, the altar is open. You want to come and pray. For whatever reason, certainly I encourage you to do so. You may be seated. Amen, amen. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Pastor, for the message tonight. Um, I think we only have a few announcements, so just take note of this. Men, uh, you are encouraged to attend our men's fellowship. Uh, this coming Saturday, 8 o'clock in the morning, it's the third floor, so I um, mean, that's our time to get together, fellowship, and just listen to the word, okay? So um, to make plans to attend uh, this coming Saturday. Okay, and then if you have your offering, uh, please uh, drop them in the box as you leave the auditorium tonight. And then, again, uh, we request that uh, 
let's just uh, be patient ano? and then we'll just go out one row up after another okay we start from the back para hindi po tayo mag uh, kumpulan dun sa likod okay all right i think that's all our announcement tonight let's let's all stand please let us sing our closing song and then we'll close in prayer standing on the promises of god standing on the promises all together standing on the promises of christ my king through eternal ages let his praises ring glory in the highest i will shout it as we close our service this evening thank you for your word we thank you lord for your goodness and father as we depart from this place again we ask that you'd watch over us protect us dear lord and bless us help us to serve you with all of our hearts cleanse us dear lord and supply our needs and bless us and uh, bring us back again for our next service in jesus name amen amen thank you